Welcome. Come on in, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for adjusting to the daylight savings time. All right, welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. I am Emily Newman. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the officiant today. Wes is one community unified across time and space, gathering for these Sunday platforms to affirm our values and commit to a better world. So I wanna welcome those of you who are here in the hall, those who are watching on Zoom, and those watching the recording later. If you are on Zoom, please check the chat for welcome and various tips from Trang uh, Jong, today's Zoom chat usher. If you're here in the hall and you need an assistive listening device, please ask the sound team at the back. Special welcome to our visitors today. We'd love to get to know you and answer any questions you have. So you can get on our email list by filling out the connection form at tiny.cc slash westconnects or send an email to wes at ethicalsociety.org. And if you're here in person, we invite you to stop by the welcome table after platform or just chat up anyone with a white name badge. Folks can also share joys, concerns, or sorrows that they would like to let Casey, the pastoral care team, and or the community know about. Fill out one of the blue West Cares forms that you find on the welcome table, fold it up, and you can either put it in the collection basket or hand it to a greeter. We'll pass it on to Casey. There's also a digital form at tiny.cc slash West Cares. And uh, checking on the Zoom, um, see what's going on with our online folks. Bunch of good mornings. Good morning to you too. Um, more good mornings, lovely. So we'll continue to check back, keep everyone engaged together. Um, it's a good, uh, it is good to connect and to share this time together. Onto our opening words this morning are from A Strong Reverence for Life by Carol Hippo Oxky. I should have asked. <laughs> Hippocotsky. Sorry, I'll move on. Someone will correct me later. <laughs> Those of us who call ourselves religious humanists have a strong reverence for life. Many of us experience a deep sense of awe before the mystery of life and death. Those powers greater than ourselves. We share a respect for science and reason, and we are willing to live with ambiguity, to live without definitive answers. We share a deep concern about injustice and the fate of human life, indeed of all life on this planet, our home in the universe. We identify with the human story, even if we recognize it is as intimately tied to the story of the rest of this world. My, my environmentalism and my humanism are inextricably related. My humanism tells me that human life is important and worthy of respect and care. My environmentalism tells me that to be human is to be part of an interdependent circle of all life. It is counterproductive to imagine ourselves as separate. My knowledge of today's world informs me that planet Earth and thus human life are in danger because of the threat of global warming. I want to see life, including human life, preserved and thriving on our planet. My environmental humanism compels me to work to reduce the causes of climate change, the human practices that threaten the survival of life on Earth. Our opening music today is Turn the World Around. Feel free to sing along.
you to our very own West Chorus. Each week we read our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. If you are interested in taking a turn to read the statement of purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc slash read SOP. You can read it here in person or make a recording that will be included in a future platform. Today's reader is Laura Briskin Limehouse, representing the West Writers Group that meets after Wednesdays at West. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit. With faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capacities. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of reverence and responsibility for each other and the earth. We invite you to join our community of children and adults as we work for a world where love and justice cross all borders. Thank you, Laura. As Laura lights our community candle, I invite everyone to join in our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. And we'll now hear from a member of our stewardship team. No? The, yes? <laughs> okay, I'm the member of the stewardship team, and this is our stewardship moment, and I'm going to use it to say, you're all coming next Sunday, right? It's coming together to build a brighter, a bigger, uh, no, a stronger future for Wes. Come and eat with us. Yep. Uh, let us enter now into a centering time of our platform. Each week we ring this chime in solidarity with people around the world. Today I am particularly mindful of those displaced by climate change. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us. Let us open our hearts to compassion for those who suffer. And let us commit ourselves to the work that calls for our love. Go ahead and take a moment to take a big, deep breath, if that feels good for you. Maybe do a little bit of stretching, mindful of that there might be people next to you. Notice if there's tension in your shoulders, in your jaw, just let yourself release a little bit. And as you release and let yourself arrive in this moment, maybe call to mind an image of a favorite natural landscape. Maybe it's in the woods or in the mountains, by the beach or by the river. Maybe you like the desert that you're very far from. Maybe you like underwater scapes to see what the fish are up to down there. 
whatever it is, bring it to mind and think of it with love. Keep breathing. And when your mind wanders, come back to that scene. I invite you to continue relaxing and thinking of nature as we continue our meditation in silence and the music that follows. Today's reading is Fierce Urgency by Reverend Ashley Horan. My four-year-old four daughter has taught me this lesson. When a child wants to derail business as usual, to curb the hubris of adults who dare believe in schedules and plans and productivity, one fierce little body and one clear piercing voice strategically applied to the right pressure point will change the course of the day's events. My comrades in organizing have taught me this lesson. When a silenced people want to be heard, to raise from dry bones a living, breathing dream of new ways of moving, being, incarnating freedom, one small, tenacious group whose hearts beat in rhythm, rising shoulder to shoulder against the inevitable, will bend the arc from impossibility to hope. Our young climate leaders are teaching us this lesson. When the grown-ups and the old movements are too slow, as the sea levels rise and the hurricanes rage and the migrants flee and the corporations profit, one generation, both young and silenced, refusing to accept an inheritance of doom, will take toward the streets and move us toward life. Blessings upon them as they teach us, organize us, beckon us in, and call us out. 
May their fierce urgency and uncompromising clarity show us a path toward healing and freedom and hope. Our platform speaker today is senior leader Casey Slack. Their talk is called After Lawns and will address how climate change impacts the ways we live. Thank you, Emily. So our social justice theme this month is climate change. And I will admit to having been a little hesitant in the mm, five and a half years of my career as a professional clergy person to talk much about climate change because I don't know what to do. Because that problem is so big that I get overwhelmed when I think about what I can say that is true and authentic and genuine and means something. I spent my whole life worried about climate and the environment around me. I was talking with our Earth Ethics Action Team the other day and mentioned that my actual first bit of organizing or social justice activism in my life was that I formed a environmentalist organization called the Cat Love Whale Club when I was in second grade. What we did was we researched different animals and their habitats so we could learn what we could do to help improve their lives. There was a lot of uh, cutting of soda rings. Any like millennials? I'm looking at you, please tell me that you remember this. <laughs> okay. Um, it was a big deal in like the early 90s, late 90s to cut your soda can rings so that fish and Wildlife didn't get stuck in them. I was very involved in that. In fact, uh, I was an early opposer of SeaWorld because I loved whales and I loved orcas more than I loved any other kind of animal. I understand that that's not technically a whale. It's fine. And the Cat Love Whale Club went to SeaWorld. There used to be a SeaWorld in Aurora, Ohio, five minutes from my house when I was growing up, a, a SeaWorld, which was closed for half of the year. So it's bad enough, right, to have this whale in a little tiny tank. And then in a place that is closed, you've brought a whale to Ohio. Anyway, we went and I had been many times before, and I'd never thought about it before, but we'd been studying animals. And we went, and I saw the poor orca's little bent-over fin, and I went, oh, no. I hate this now. And still, I struggle to talk about climate change, about the environment, and so this month's theme is a challenge for me. I was thinking and thinking and thinking, and I realized that there is something easy, well, relatively easy, something I am passionate about that is relatively easy to communicate, and that something is lawns, and that I hate them. As it turns out, if I'm telling the truth, I have never been a fan of the monoculture lawn. My father is a big monoculture lawn guy. Any of you who know anything about him will be unsurprised by that. My father likes conformity. He likes things that are normal and in straight lines. It's been a time. Um, actually, I was not allowed to mow the front lawn at my parents' house. I've never been allowed to mow the front lawn at my parents' house because I cannot drive a mower in a straight line. And my father refuses to have anything but perfectly straight lines in his front yard. And the lawn was always a topic of conversation. You cannot spend that kind of time on something without it becoming a big topic of conversation. And the conversation usually went like this. 
Our lawn is perfect. The neighbor does okay. The neighbor next to that does terrible because they do not mow their lawn more than once a month. The people up the street are irritating because they let the dandelions grow in their lawn. And that means the dandelions blow down the street and dandelions wind up in my lawn. As it happens, the people up the street with the dandelions were my grandparents. <laughs> and my grandfather, well, for a number of reasons, not none of which that I love dandelions, was very intentionally not getting rid of his dandelions. He also had, my grandparents had 15 acres at the time, and so that was a lot of potential dandelions and a lot of other random weeds that nobody bothered to mow because why? I'm not gonna go back there. And the only times we ever did go back there was to pick little baby strawberries out of the grass near the tall grasses or to run through the big grasses to get into the woods where the blackberries were. That is, if we weren't sustaining ourselves on the current bush in the closer lawn instead. So I grew up sort of split between these worlds all of a tenth of a mile apart. My parents' lawn, which felt really good to be barefoot in, and I never once got an injury from walking on. And my grandparents' yard, which was full of stuff, which when my cousin Jason decided he wanted to mow the lawn by mowing in star patterns, Nobody cared, the lawn got mowed, that's all grandpa cared about. Where we could forage for food when grandma kicked 12 of us out of the house in the middle of the day. If you have a million cousins, it's good to have a big yard to run around with your million cousins in. Anyway, I have never liked a monoculture lawn. And when I was a little kid across the street from our house was a farm. It wasn't a working farm anymore, but the kind of grown over that a former farm becomes. And I was so angry when they sold it to turn it into quarter acre lot development housing. I was so angry that we went to a city council meeting, my parents and I, and they would not let me, all of six at the time, stand up and speak, so my father spoke for me, a complicated man, and he said, my daughter said we didn't move to the country to live in the suburbs. And that is true, we did not move to the country to live in the suburbs, but then the suburbs arrived across the street. Identical houses with perfect monoculture lawns little, tiny, so small that my father couldn't even respect them. It doesn't take any work to keep up that much yard. Okay. And since then, I haven't lived anywhere that I have a yard. I moved out of my parents' house when I was just 17 to go to college, and then I lived in a dorm and another dorm and another dorm and an apartment 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 and an apartment. And an apartment. <laughs> And in the rental unit where Caitlin and I currently live, we have about this, this much grass, just, and we don't cut it because it's this, there's this much of it. Why? But we're buying a house. And the house has a yard. And the yard has been very much on my mind lately. When we viewed the house, one of the neighbors was outside and he said, he was so excited that we might be his neighbors. And then he said, we keep our yards nice. And I said, oh no. And he said, I mow this front bit of grass. And I said, cool, you can do that. I'll handle the back, which is where all of the actual yard is. And I started making plans to do literally any other thing, but have grass that I have to mow. One, because I spent enough of my childhood on a lawnmower or pushing a lawnmower and I'm done. That's over for me. Two, I don't want to buy a lawnmower. Three, I don't want to be near a lawnmower. Four, 
grass is terrible. And I don't just mean like my aesthetics don't like grass, but my aesthetics do not like grass, that is correct. But grass is, as it happens, not beneficial to the environment almost at all. It takes a lot of water. It takes a lot of chemicals to keep it a monoculture. Monocultures are bad. It is bad when things are all the same, whether those things are blades of grass or people. And theoretically, we learned as a country what happens when you plant the same thing over and over and over and over again in the same soil, and then you get a dust bowl. No, did we learn that lesson? Hmm. I have questions for us. Notes for the rest of this. So lawns, as Americans use them, just different from other places in the world, but the American lawn is in many ways a locus of control and conformity. It is really no surprise that my father, who I'm using as object lesson for man who came of age in the 50s and 60s, really loves conformity, who found a way he could fit in and do things correctly, who is worried all the time about whether or not things are correct. Because lawns let you look at somebody else's life and decide if they're doing it correctly, right? My father's judgment about other people's lawns is part of a process of social control and judgment that says you should have money and time, one or the other, to maintain a meticulous lawn. Grass does not want to be the sort of blanket that we often see it as. Weeds happen. Plants happen, dandelions happen, thank everything. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the American lawn. When white people got here, the grasses of this country were not made for grazing cattle. They were not good for your livestock, but the livestock didn't much care and so they ate all of it anyway. And then it didn't grow back because it wasn't meant to be grazed on. So the colonizers said, all right, Europe, send us some more grass. And they got different kinds of grass, including the Kentucky bluegrass that is now the lawn standard, at least on the East Coast. For the most part, American homes followed European trends. You see that here more than where I grew up in Ohio or where I most recently lived in Los Angeles. Houses that are pretty close to the street have maybe a little front garden and then more of a yard in the back, a garden area. That was a European practice of privacy in the context of a home. In the 18th century, a carpet of green was installed at Versailles, and suddenly, rich people had ideas. That became a standard of lawn design in France and in England, which was really into copying French for the aesthetic at the time. And then George Washington and Thomas Jefferson imported European landscapers to make Monticello and Mount Vernon into beautifully landscaped open areas. This gave America's rich people something to aspire to, and that something was green carpet in front of your house. The early suburbs on the East Coast, if you listen to their names, you'll hear a lot of the word park. They were literally trying to look like parks. Right? There had been a movement for public parks, public spaces, and then these private communities wanted to look like. They were these beautiful natural places you could run around in, which of course meant 
that everybody's lawn was exactly the same. And then when we started traveling more by train and by car, we redesigned how our homes relate to the street. It stopped being about privacy and about keeping horse smell from you and started being active pressure to beautify the front of your house so that travelers would have something nice to look at as they went by. Then after World War II, government-backed mortgages encouraged builders to make more blue-collar tract housing. And they included big lawns wherever they could because that made it look more like rich people's housing. Wild. In the United States today, there are an estimated 163,800 square kilometers of lawn space. That's basically all of New England above New York, like Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, the whole bit, just grass. Just grass that nothing can eat just grass that takes a lot of water. That isn't just lawns. That includes parks and the only thing I hate more than lawns, golf courses. I have a shirt, which I considered wearing today, but I don't really wear t-shirts on Sunday. It says, no turfs and no turf. No trans-exclusionary radical feminists. No turf, like no carpets of grass. Against transphobia and golf courses. The way that we use grass in this country right now is wildly unsustainable, and the risks range from a depletion of water aquifers to the devastation of local ecosystems. A perfect lawn can also contribute to rising carbon dioxide emissions. So what other options do you have? What am I gonna do with this piece of land? It's this big, not even a quarter of an acre. My father does not think I have any land because I don't and I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> what else can you do? Well, some things are really easy. If you simply mow the lawn you have less and don't use pesticides on it, that's gonna cause a lot of improvement, right? A lawn that is unmowed is space for bees and pollinators to live and hide. Not using pesticides feels like a pretty obvious, please don't use pesticides. Don't, things that end inside, maybe not. What if we didn't do that? Genocide, pesticide, none of that. Don't take the leaves out of your yard in the fall. When they fall down, let them fall down and be leaves. This has a couple of benefits. It gives the bees a place to hide. The bees need a lot of places to hide. We have been forcing the bees out in public more often than they would like to be. Please respect the bees' privacy at this and all times. But also those leaves will turn into nutrients for the yard over the course of the winter. They will, in fact, biodegrade their leaves, friends. In the fall, when I see people putting all the leaves into big plastic bags, I think, what are we doing here? What is this? The answer to a natural process is to put it in plastic bags. If that is not the American relationship with the environment. I don't know if there's a clearer picture. You can do some other things that are even better. You can add keystone plants to your gardening. So when you're thinking about, what am I gonna plant in my yard? What am I gonna, okay, it's just me who's thinking about that? It's spring, everybody who has planting in their life should be thinking about what they're gonna plant. Well, take a look. There are long lists on the internet. I will send you the list of keystone plants. You could also talk to any member of the Earth Ethics team. Sue Jacobson is right here. She knows lots of things. You could talk to Terry Smith, who helps tend to our 
keystone plant and pollinator garden out there, which is beautiful. I think Terry might even be downstairs today. Y'all know things about keystone plants, <laughs> I'm saying. And there are two big kinds of keystone plants. There are host plants, which feed the caterpillars of approximately 90% of butterflies and moths. And then there are plants that feed specialist bees who only eat pollen from specific plants. I've been talking about bees a lot. You probably know that the, the bees are dying, that one of the planet's big problems is that we have fewer and fewer bees every year. Some of this is because in our love for yards and parks that all look the same, we have gotten rid of so many of the keystone plants around the country. So every keystone plant we can add to our yard here at West, to our yards at home, to a garden that you have access to, to a garden that you are willing to put a hole in, I don't care whose it is, that keystone plant is going to offer food and sustenance and space to live for bees that need our help really desperately. And without bees, there's a lot less pollination. There's a lot less flowers in general. The world is more beautiful with bees. So let's take some care of the bees. You can also replace your monoculture grass with grass alternatives. This is a big project with a lot of research that needs to be done if you're going to do it. But it begins with killing the grass you have by maybe putting cardboard over it for a season or tilling it under. These grasses are pretty, they want to come back. We've bred them to be interested in returning. You want to make sure you get weeds out of your lawn, not because weeds are bad, but because many of the weeds that we have are actually not indigenous to the areas that we live. They are weeds we brought from Europe, because it turns out if you bring the cow, you bring whatever's in the cow's digestive system, and that could include weeds. There are a lot of grass alternatives that actually don't even need mowed. They stay low to the ground, they are pretty, they are different, they're still green, they still kind of fit in. So think about, in your particular context, what you might do. Maybe you don't have a yard. Maybe you don't have a yard because you chose to live somewhere where that's not something. That's cool. Applause for that. Maybe you have already done a bunch of changes to your yard. Claps for that. But where can you add something else? Can you help us find a way to move away from having a lawn here at Wes? Do you have access to a garden that you could put some pollinators or keystone plants in? Do you have a friend in your neighborhood who is maybe a little over attached to the green carpet? And you could have a conversation just about maybe mowing the lawn a little less. Because any step in that direction is a step that is going to help the bees and the butterflies and all of the other plants. It's going to help us breathe better. It's going to keep our water cleaner. Any step that we take is a good one. There are, of course, challenges to getting this done. Money being a big one, right? Lawn care is expensive in general. And when you're doing something outside of the standard, it can be a little more expensive, right? The top advice if you're going to completely redo your lawn is to hire an expert. And if you can afford that, do it. And if you can't, there are lots of DIY guides on the internet. You have resources here, but also the government might offer you some subsidies. The DC city government has a bunch of different grants available. We're looking into one for a rainwater garden here at West. In Montgomery County, they've done some of the other difficult work for you already, because the other difficulty is your neighbors and the potential of a housing association. 
right? The other difficulty is someone you're in a contract with who gets to say how you keep your yard. Well, in Montgomery County, they have already passed a law that says that not mowing your lawn or installing alternative grasses can't be reported as a nuisance. What if we work on legislation like that wherever we live? Because everybody should get to decide to have a greener lawn. I mean that conceptually, not literally. That everybody should be able to step outside of that conformity box that is the green, green carpet of a lawn and say, you know what, my values and my aesthetics, either or, both and, say that I want to do this. Because we're all going to benefit from, again, bees, butterflies, pollinators, air, water, right? Work together with your neighbors. Or if you live in a building where there is perhaps a rooftop and the rooftop has maybe a garden, or it doesn't yet, there could be a garden there. And that garden could have keystone plants. It could have pollinators. You could, build, you could put a tree on a roof if you wanted to. Not for the full of the tree's life. They get roots. But you could do a lot of things. So I encourage you to think about where you're at, what your situation is, and what a step you can take is. Because the problem of climate change is, is big and huge and terrifying. And the only way to address it is to take the steps that we can take. I am clear that a golf course is a bigger problem than any of us could ever hope to be. I am clear that the very wealthy lawns, which are meticulous and giant, are a bigger problem than most of your lawns likely are. And we can work on that stuff too, and we should. We should work on everything we can work on, but one thing that you can do, just you, is plant something in your yard. Plant something here. Join a community garden. Bother your HOA until they say, OK, fine. Everybody doesn't have to have perfect grass. Bother your city government until they say, OK, fine. It's not a nuisance. Each little step will help a lot. And the bees certainly will thank you for any work that you do. Hopefully, their thanks don't come with stingers, but more with honey that we have gotten from them ethically. But as we continue this month and into next month when we will have some celebration for Earth Day, think about what little steps you can take. How, in the same way as we change ourselves and our community step by step, just stick into it, we change the world that way as well. Things are urgent and scary, and we need quicker action from our government, from the world's governments, than we are currently seeing. But that doesn't mean it's time to give up. That actually means it's time to do it a little harder. So as spring springs, think of the bees. Plant something. And if you want to plant something here at Wes, whether that thing is a plant or an idea, you just let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. In a few minutes, we'll have community sharing time when we can write into the chat or share in person about what resonated with you during this platform. While we listen to today's musical response, you might prepare by reflecting on a personal experience or an activity at West that the platform brings to mind.
Thank you. This is the time when we add our own voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates with our exper personal experience. So for our online participants, I invite you to share in the Zoom chat. Um, and if you're watching this video later on, you can put in the comments there. If you're here in person, you can come to the microphone here on the floor and share your brief comments so that others may also share. And um, we'll check over, I see we only have one so far from Zoom, so if any people are ready to line up, go ahead. Um, Barbara says, thank you for this interesting talk. I love seeing the trees blowing in the background by the windows at West today. At least I don't have a problem reaching the microphone. Uh, my name is uh, Peter, uh, he is him. Um, Recently, I have been, uh, I've become aware of a series of NOVA uh, shows that, uh, that uh, were created last year. Uh, five uh, shows on the ancient earth telling us the history of the earth starting four and a half billion years ago. And uh, a major theme of these shows is what has the role of CO2 been in the history of the earth? And it turns out that it is a lot more spectacular than I was taught when I grew, grew up. Uh, it turns out that the first major change in CO2 uh, occurred uh, when there were volcanoes all over the place and they're spewing lots of basalt onto the earth. And so the rain was coming down and it was dissolving carbon dioxide into the rain, and the rain was falling on the basalt and uh, forming, uh, and forming uh, carbon uh, rock. And then that rock was then flowing down to the ocean and falling to the bottom of the oceans, and therefore the carbon dioxide had been completely removed from the atmosphere. And this continued until the Earth froze solid. The entire Earth was covered entirely by ice and glaciers. Uh, it turns out that this was to occur later. The second time was during the Carboniferous period, where again, CO2 was being removed from the atmosphere, this time to form our current oil and gas and coal reserves. Uh, and so um, this whole question of how important is CO2 and do we need to really learn how to control the amount of CO2 that we have in our atmosphere? The answer is absolutely. And th this whole NOVA series was trying to emphasize that point. And uh, that's not the only place where our thinking predates uh, the thinking about climate change. There's a lot of that thinking that I think we need to change. I'm Judy, she, her, and uh, two things, um, well, three things. Thank you, as ever. And I have a confession to make. My father was a, had a lawn care service business <laughs> for many, many years. Um, and number three is when I get home, my husband and I are going to have a long talk about our lawn. <laughs> Thank you for teaching me a whole bunch of stuff I didn't know. Good morning, everybody. I'm Julie. She, hers, and I have... Um, Always a lot to say, right? <laughs> I've been living in my house in East Silver Spring for 30 years. And when I bought it, it was beautifully landscaped, of course, in order to have curb appeal. Both the front, this very small front yard, and the smallish backyard were landscaped. And guess what? I never took care of it, <laughs> either did Ellen, and it really went to shit. <laughs> I mean, not really that bad, but pretty bad. And the backyard didn't do too well either because we wound up having dogs, and then we wound up having children. 
And uh, we never seeded or watered any of this. And uh, the only thing that we really took care of was that strip of grass between our sidewalk and the street, which we felt was the right thing to do. We never seeded that either. We let it sort of grow to weeds, but we, we mowed it regularly and we helped mow our, our neighbors as well. But uh, it's been hard in a way. Um, I mean, the backyard's been wonderful. We had a children's play set, we had a sandbox, we had sprinklers that the kids would run into and where they built snow people and had space for birthday parties with bubbles and misters and bouncy houses. And Jasper and I built a ton of fairy houses back there. And the grass, it was hard to grow back there because we have a giant oak over our house and oaks are very generous. And I always tell people never buy a house with a white oak because the white oak, which is enormous, gives us crazy amount of leaves every year, crazy amount of bark every year, tons of twigs every year. It's hard to keep up with it. I mean, my, my husband who moved in in 2013 does mow the leaves and leaves them there. But uh, we also get a deluge of acorns every few years, which is insane. And when my kids were little, we used to collect the seeds and turn them into the seed contest at their elementary school in order to plant trees on the Potomac in order to, you know, prevent, in order to, I don't know, grow a lot of trees, which is good for the environment and, uh, and cleaning the water. So on my block, there are a few people who've lived there longer than us, like 10 years. Those people have lawns. Those people love their lawns. And as they've been aging, they've been hiring teenagers and Latino immigrants in order to take care of it and do their landscaping. And these people care a lot about curb appeal and they are retiring in place. So my house has really never had curb appeal since I've lived there. And when my kids were little, the front yard was where we built igloos. It's where they chalked up the play, the, the paths. It's where they, they played a lot. So I met my husband in 2013, and he built a large vegetable garden in the front yard uh, because he had had one in his rental house in Alexandria. And then, uh, you know, it was tomatoes, basil, cucumbers. And then when he moved in, he took over the whole front yard, both sides of the path with vegetable gardens. And then after a while, he put up chicken wire to keep bunnies and squirrels out, which didn't work so well, and occasionally deer. And um, one of the great things about it is he's been able to meet all of our neighbors because he gives them vegetables uh, all the time. And then people stop by as they're walking their dogs and they say, wow, this is really great. Um, but, and we don't have to buy vegetables from, from June to November, but here's a special announcement I have. I told the chorus this morning, Alex and I just bought a house in Frederick. Um, probably not going to move for another year. We have to get through this growing season. Um, but, uh, it's a place that doesn't have any lawns. And it's a place where I can grow flowers and he can grow vegetables, a much bigger plot, which is his dream for retirement. And there's a boys and girls club across the street and, and we can volunteer and teach kids about gardening. But we have to sell my house and we have to make a decision about what we're gonna make it look like because truthfully that vegetable garden is going to have to come down. And, um, like I said, we're not going to do that until growing season is over. But I really appreciated everything you said about lawns and, you know, golf courses, Trump golf courses, and you know, and uh, you know, just just how bad they are for the environment with, between pesticides and and the lawns that are grown in both California and Arizona and use up all this water in places where we don't have water. So I really loved your platform and thank you so much. And I apologize for my windbaggedness. <laughs> and even the golf course is where Barack Obama plays. Um, well, thank you for this talk. It's a topic that's very much on my mind. I wanna make sure that everybody here and everybody watching or listening online 
knows the name Doug Ptolemy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. He is a, I think now, retired professor from University of Delaware who has made suburban ecology uh, his mission uh, and, and teaching everybody the important things we can do with the millions of acres that we've devoted to front lawns. Um, he has several books. He has several um, uh, YouTube videos that are very, very instructive. I recently saw one. He said, you know, um, with your property, there are four things that you need to think about when you uh, design your, your landscape architecture. Number one, supporting pollinators. Number two, sequestering carbon. Number three, managing the rainscape. And number four, supporting the food web. Uh, so now I've begun to think about my yard and our whole suburban neighborhood uh, in, in that context. Um, how do we accomplish those four things or at least contribute to those four things? Good morning, Jeffrey, he, him. Um, it can be overwhelming. So uh, one solution is don't try and do it all at once. I'm going piecemeal, a native plant here, a native plant there, just a little bit at a time. And then I'm kind of new around here, so maybe it already exists, but how about a native plant exchange if it doesn't? Thanks. Thank you all. Um, we got a couple um, more comments I'll summarize here. Cynthia shared about how she grew up in a rural area where the um, inpatient richer folks would um, kind of have the sod prepared for them in strips and um, pay a good bunch of money. And then as kids, they didn't realize uh, that they, uh, how that worked, and they used to just thought that there were these fields to play in, and, made, um, and that made the farmers really mad because they were kind of ruining this fancy turf, uh, green carpeting, she says. Um, and then Shayla um, is, has a shaded backyard, so would appreciate anyone's recommendations on what she should plant in her, in her space. So um, thank you all. For, for sharing your thoughts and experience, and we'll keep that sharing going for folks looking for more advice. Um, and then just as we share our perspectives in this community, so too do we share our resources and gifts. Here at WES, we split all undesignated gifts in the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. During March, we are pleased to support the Washington Interfaith Network's Climate Justice Campaign. Wynn is committed to training and developing neighborhood leaders, addressing community issues, and holding elected and corporate officials accountable in Washington, D.C. Wynn is working towards a just green future that includes fair wage green jobs, electrified public and affordable housing. Uh, ceasing the district's reliance on methane gas and building a coalition of D.C. residents at the forefront of change. So learn more at windc.org slash climate. Let's all take a moment to prepare to respond to the invitation to generosity as we are able to donate online through the Breeze system. Go to tiny.cc slash westgives or click on give on the website, ethicalsociety.org. Donate in person today. You can place your cash or check in the basket in the back of the hall on your way out. And you can always send a check by mail. Thank you for your generosity. We'll now receive your gifts and the gift of music.
Thank you so much to the many people who helped to create this morning's time together. Today's platform speaker, Casey Slack, and our own Wes Chorus. Staff members, Indara Miles, Robin Kravitz, and Maceo Thomas. And of course, our platform production volunteers, the tech team members, slide artists, Zoom chat usher, and in-person greeters. I want to mention a few other things coming up in the life of our community. So today we have our biology reading group meeting on Zoom 1 p.m. Then our mental health support group meets on Zoom at 2 p.m. And then on Monday, the global connections group will be on Zoom at 7.30 p.m. The uh, emails to access those links are all online and in the news and notes. Um, Many hands make light work, and you can help make our West Sunday Cafe bring joy to all by coming a little early to the platform once a month to help make coffee. Sign up at tiny.cc slash West Coffee Sign Up, or jot down your name on the sign up sheet at the coffee table to join our merry band of caffeinators. If you have a song, instrumental, vocal, both, that you would like to perform some Sunday, please get in touch with Karen Storms. We'd love to hear from you. And next Sunday, Casey Slack's talk will be Through the Goo, celebrating our time in the goo of change and committing ourselves to Wes's blossoming future. We also look forward to hearing from musical guest Leah Morris. Um, then today, after next week's platform for a special event, the 2024-2025 Pledge Campaign theme is Coming Together, Building a Strong Wes. In the spirit of Coming Together, the stewardship team is hosting a brunch to launch the campaign. It'll be held here in the main hall after platform on March 17th. We'll have plenty of food and drinks, including vegan and gluten-free options, and there will be music, fun activities, and plenty of time to socialize. If you've also seen, there are special shirt opportunities for people that want to get a little bit more festive. Uh, the Community Relations Committee's next session is Sunday, March 24th, 1230 in the Social Hall. We'll explore the urgency with an, uh, so that causes unrealistic expectations and how we can replace it with more compassionate practices. There will also be sessions on April 21st on fear of conflict, May 19th on denial and defensiveness, and June 16th on either, either or and the binary. And the final session of the Lifelong Learning Team's Future Planning Series is now Monday, April 29th. So that was a date change. It's now April 29th on Zoom, where we'll discuss caring for someone's remains after they're deceased. There are a lot more options than traditional funeral or cremation. And lastly, I want to remind folks that the West Auction Team is seeking new team members to support our 2024 auction happening Saturday, November 16th. So please talk to me if you have ideas um, of the theme, how you'd like to support, and any other question you have on auction. So that is it for announcements today. As always, you can find information about opportunities to connect in the weekly news and notes email and the calendar page of Wes's website. Um, again, if you have, if you are new to our community, please introduce yourself in person or via the connection form at tiny.cc slash westconnects or an email to wes at ethicalsociety.org. Uh, at the conclusion of the platform, you can join us for a social hour either here in the hall um, or Zoom at tiny.cc slash westcoffeehour. And I now invite you to join our closing sing-along music in closing words. Before we sing together, I just want to point out that not only will Leah Morris be here next Sunday, she will also be here this Wednesday at 7.30 to work with any West member who would like to join with her on one or more of the songs that she'll be doing next Sunday. So please consider that an invitation to work with one of the great musicians formerly of the D.C. area but now uh, gracing us with her presence uh, next week. That will be taught uh, orally, no music reading uh, required.
And now for our closing words. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment, working for climate justice and honoring growth and change within ourselves. Thank you all for joining today's platform in person or remotely. We look forward to connecting with you again soon.